All right, so at this point, I'm um, so happy to have uh, Matthew Shepard with us to be talking this morning about the resources that uh, Xerces offers. Uh, you may know Xerces, the um, Society for Invertebrate Conservation. Um, they work with pollinator habitat, they work with endangered species, monarchs, and other um, invertebrates who are threatened. So working on conservation, also habitat enhancement. And Matthew's been with Xerces for, uh, for over 20 years, working with outreach, community engagement, uh, conservation in towns and cities. And so he works with many folks like all of you who have joined us this morning, helping, um, helping us to make sense of the science, to use best practices, to uh, conserve pollinators and other creatures, uh, create the habitat that um, is really healthy for, um, for all of this, um, this wildlife that we care so much about. Matthew is a co-author of Attracting Native Pollinators, a book there on the screen, um, really a foundational publication that um, I've used for a lot of our po volunteer pollinator training. Um, also Gardening for Butterflies, a wonderful illustra uh, illustrated book that talks about plants and habitat and also um, so many of those wonderful winged creatures that we care about, so how to bring uh, more butterflies to our gardens. Um, he's also the editor of Wings um, magazine, the Xerces um, a periodical that comes out. And I've linked to an article that uh, Matthew just uh, authored on um, uh, partnering for pollinator habitat in, um, in communities. So you'll want to check that out. So I'm sure you're familiar with, uh, with the Xerces Society, at least I hope you are, a science-based nonprofit organization that protects wildlife through the conservation of invertebrates and their habitats. And uh, we're so um, thrilled to have you here with us this morning. Matthew, share some of those great Xerces resources and um, get us all out there working in the community. That's great. Thank you so much, Denise. Um, and good morning, good afternoon, hello um, to everybody who's out there. Um, I know Denise mentioned that it's early on the West Coast. And yes, I'm in Western Oregon, so it's still dark outside my window. Um, but th that's just fine. Um, I will share my screen um, and hopefully we'll be able to just get started. Um, hmm. I'm not convinced I might I managed to do my screen sharing correctly I'm there. I'm still seeing your thumbnails. Uh, yeah. yeah, no, I'll, I'll go, go back. Um, and hopefully this will work better. Does that work better? Yep, that looks great. Excellent, good. Now I was a little confused because normally I get a little green line around the outside of my screen when it's when it's going. So that's good. Um, but yeah, anyway, hello everybody. Um, Denise was kind enough to give a very nice introduction to me there. Um, and so yeah, I work for the Xerces Society and I've been around for a long, long time now. Um, and that means I've had the pleasure of meeting with and collaborating with and supporting and helping, I mean, hundreds, if not thousands of people over all of those years. Um, I was asked to come along today and talk about resources. I know you've had some fabulous speakers already and, and have another one coming up after me. Um, and, you know, you know, Doug will have told you all about how amazing oak trees are and Heather would have shared all the incredible images of, of bees and flowers and such like. And then I get to kind of talk about fact sheets. Um, but it's all right, I'm going to do more than that. I'm not just going to go through and say, well, here's an interesting fact sheet and it does this. Um, I'm going to try and cover um, and, and give you enough resources so that if you're not quite sure what to do, um, you'll at least have some direction after this morning. So the Xerces Society, we are an environmental nonprofit. Um, we were named after the Xerces blue butterfly, which is one of the first butterflies known to go extinct in North America because of human activity. Um, it used to live in the San Francisco Peninsula. And then as that city expanded, and particularly as it moved um, into the, the dune systems on the Pacific coast and around the Golden Gate area, it, and, and, you know, and that was the end of the Xerces blue um, as its habitat was lost and it was last seen flying in 1943. Um, 
This, this photograph here shows a page from John Comstock's Butterflies of California. Um, it's the only book I know, the only butterfly go, guide I know of that includes the Xerxes Blue. And that was published in 1927. And then about 15 years later, the, the butterfly had disappeared. Um, as an organization, Xerxes has now been around for half a century. We were founded in 1971 by Robert Michael Pyle, the um, natural history writer, lepidopterist, butterfly enthusiast, speaker. Um, and our, our fundamental mission is to protect the natural world through conservation of invertebrates and their habitat. And we do that, we have four primary ways in which we do that, one of which is hands-on conservation. So we work with people all over the place on, you know, trying to change conditions on the ground, creating habitat, managing habitat, improving, protecting habitat. Um, anything from, you know, small urban gardens through to vast wild landscapes. Because um, if we can't change conditions on the ground, then we're, we're not having a true impact. We also get involved with advocacy, although we much prefer to have a positive relationship with people and organizations. Um, there are times when we have to stand up and say, you know, no, you know, that can't happen, you know, or this must happen. Um, most of our advocacy revolves around protection of endangered species. So for example, the rusty patch bumblebee, um, which is the only bee protected under the Federal Endangered Species Act in the continental United States, is there thanks to our efforts. Um, but we also work on pesticides, on trying to reduce um, the impact of pesticides um, and, and limit um, the destruction they cause. We are a science-based and evidence-based organization, and so we do have networks of scientists in universities and agencies around North America and overseas. Um, but we also are directly involved with research ourselves, whether that's surveying for, you know, so that we understand the distribution of you know, rare butterflies or obscure snails or freshwater mussels, or figuring out the best way to um, implement habitat improvements whilst fitting organic farming requirements, for example. So we, we're not just taking science and, and evidence from that other people have created, we're also um, underpinning our own work like that. And then we're doing education. So things like this talk today, all our publications or our numerous fact sheets and other events. And then although, I mean, I, I say I've been involved with Xerxes now for more than 20 years, it's 23 plus years now. When I started, it was only five people and we're now about 75. Um, and so over that period of time, we've grown hugely, which personally I find quite surprising given that we work on insects and all those little icky, creepy, crawly, pesky bugs um, to have, have found enough support to build our work and for enough people to feel that our work is important and to have grown so much, it's quite remarkable. Um, but as an organization, Xerxes is much bigger than our staff. We have you know, all these things listed on the screen here. We have thousands of members. Um, we have uh, ambassador volunteers like, like Marsha, for, for example, who do amazing outreach. We have community science volunteers who gather data, the foundations business support us, the people we work with, on and on and on. So that the, the, as an organization, we're so much bigger than just our staff. So, you want to create a pollinator garden. That's really what we're all here um, to talk about um, and, and to learn about. Um, and so I just want to very quickly, you know, there are lots of different places you might be thinking about doing a garden. I mean, for sure, there's our, our private, our home gardens, and we can do all sorts of good things. But there are also, you can do things like, you know, creating habitat in a community garden. You can be um, putting in school gardens. Um, you can be working on these street strips, you know, some people call them hell strips because they can be so tough to grow things in. Um, there's rooftops, you know, pollinators fly. And so not only are they able to move from one small patch to another through our neighborhoods, but they can go up. And so there, once you start looking around, you find all sorts of opportunities. Um, built landscapes, seemingly inhospitable landscapes, we can bring habitat into office parks um, and 
downtown streets. And so there are so many different places that we can bring um, pollinator habitat into that will one make our landscapes, our neighborhoods, our downtowns, you know, more attractive, you know, a nicer place to spend time. Um, but also will bring pollinators, other insects and other wildlife in. Because obviously insects and um, particularly pollinators, mm -hmm. they are just a foundational component of our environment and our ecology. I know that you know, you've, the other speakers have, in, in, in this um, series have been sharing information with you. Um, now, I mean, I'd like to try and you know, introduce you to some of the good stuff that's going on out there. I'm going to you know, briefly review the fundamentals of pollinator conservation. I uh, will introduce you to some general resources that are available from, from Xerce Society and elsewhere. I'll then look a little more closely at some of these, the key steps, the, these fundamental components of pollinator conservation. And then I'll wrap up with some other things you might, you might consider doing, um, community level efforts, community science, that kind of stuff. What I'm not going to do in, 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 in this talk today is I'm not gonna be giving you specific advice, you know, um, just it's primarily intended to be guidance on questions you could be asking things you can consider when you're looking at your garden um, and one reason why i'm not trying to give specific advice is i know that even if i'm giving a talk within a small town a small community you know every garden is different is it sunny is it shady is it wet is it dry is it exposed is it sheltered is the sand you know, is the soil sandy or is it clay? I mean, on and on and on, there's so many tiny little changes in a garden that will affect what you could do, where you can do things, what you could plant, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so part of what I'm hoping to do today is to give you enough pointers and, 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 and help you along the way to find the answers to those questions. So these are the fundamentals of pollinator conservation as we approach it at the Xerces Society. One of the most important things is you're trying to create the conditions that support the entire life cycle of the insect. Um, and that we, you know, we have our um, Bring Back the Pollinators campaign that we base on these four principles, which are grow the pollinator friendly flowers, provide the nesting and egg laying sites, avoid using pesticides and share the word. Um, the first three are the most important, um, and those are the things that will provide the foundation for your pollinated garden, your community garden, your habitat in the park, wherever. I mean, the, these principles can be adapted, um, and it all comes down to the fact that you're trying to support the entire life cycle. You know, if you've got a, a solitary bee, you know, a sweat bee, one of the more common, abundant ones, um, you know, yes, the adult needs the flowers, but they need a nest site, and that nest site needs to be stable for the entire year because the offspring are in the nest until the following year. And then when those come out, they need the flowers, but they also need the pesticide-free um, environment so that they can then continue that life cycle. Some questions to ask yourself as you are you know, looking at whatever patch, whatever area of land you're considering for habitat, you know, what do pollinators need? There are places you can find that information out, um, as I'm sure you'll have gleaned from, also got information from this series and other series through Ohio State. Um, you can also look, you know, once you have an idea of what pollinators need, you know, what does your garden have? You know, does your garden have the flowers? Does your garden have the nest sites? What's your pesticide, your pest management? And you can then compare those two and come up. It's a bit like a Venn diagram, you know, what's missing? You know, maybe you don't have enough nest sites. Maybe you've got flowers in one part of the year, but then another part of the year, there's not so much blooming. And that leads you to, to, to answer the final question, which is what can I do to fill those gaps? And so that's the kind of the basic basic approach to take. Um, and I know from talking with, with gardeners, sometimes this can be a little overwhelming, um, particularly for, for new gardeners, because they're like, oh my, how, how, how can I do all of that? And it's like, 
you don't need to do it all at once. Um, I mean, I, I was trying to, I mean, if you can, uh, uh, you go out and you see if you can find a gardener who will admit that their garden is finished and there's nothing more they can do to it. Um, and I think that if you did find a gardener who would say that, they're probably not a true gardener um, because gardeners are always like reassessing and looking um, and thinking what, what, what could change, what's worked this year, what hasn't. So all of these, these kinds of things feed into the fact that you don't have to do it all at once. You can chunk it off. You can do one task, one project, and gradually work your way through to, to transform your landscape. It's also really important to take time to enjoy what you're creating. Um, the most, in a way, this is like the most important thing about gardening is, yeah, get that lawn chair, get that picnic blanket, and just sit there and watch sit there and enjoy it um, and you'll see the life coming in to the areas that you've transformed and it's also okay to know that sometimes you're going to fail I mean I, I do that I've been gardening for for decades now um, and although I've managed to, to create gardens everywhere I go some of them fail along the way I find well I think oh this is a beautiful plant wouldn't it be lovely over there and then I go mm, but it doesn't really like those conditions and so for me it's much better to find a plant that will grow in the conditions I have than to try and transform the conditions to support some kind of um, artificial ideal. So these are some of the really um, at the broad level some some fundamental things and in a way if, if all you can remember um, after this morning is our URL, which is xerces.org. Um, if you can get there, then you'll be able to tap into a lot of resources, um, blogs and reports and fact sheets and you know, various other things on our, on our website. Um, on our website, one particular place to go is the publications library um, and, you know, xerces.org slash publications. Or if you go to the um, resources me menu at the top of the screen and, and that drop down menu, then you'll be able to access the publications library. And you can go in there and you'll find a host of things that you can download as PDFs and print at home or print and and share with all your friends whatever you want to do but you'll find plant lists you'll find fact sheets you'll find brochures conservation guidelines reports papers etc 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 we also have the pollinated conservation resource center um, and you can also get to that from that um, resources drop down menu and you'll find that we've divided um, the united states and canada into regions and for each of those regions there's a lot of um, resources um, broken up that will help you choose plants will help you install and grow them will give guidance on site preparation and pesticide management and pesticide alternatives um, lists of plant nurseries and seed suppliers and, and further reading um, and all of that is is in there underneath the, the resource center um, if you're a gardener, you might look at it and you go like, hmm, there's not so much because the bulk of our pollinator conservation team works on working landscapes. So farms, ranches, orchards and so on. And so a lot of the publications that we've created um, have been created in, in partnership with um, the Natural Resources Conservation Service or state level agencies. And so there's a lot of things there that at first glance appear to be primarily for farms because they are, but if you look at them, you'll find a great deal of relevant information, you know, detailed plant lists, specific information on how to prepare a planting area, et cetera, et cetera. And we also have our books and I've had the good fortune of um, helping to create um, two of these. In fact, I've, I've contributed to all of them, but two of them I, I've been an author on. Um, uh, I mean, I, shameless self-promotion, I do think these are fantastic, um, but I know there are other great books out there. Um, Doug Tallamy has produced and written several, I mean, inspirational books that I have on my shelves um, and the same with, with Heather Holm. 
Um, but you can get these books wherever you like to buy your, your books, whether that's local brick and mortar or online, um, but also go to your library. You don't have to spend money to tap into the information in these books. And then I'm also aware that not everybody likes reading. Um, if, you, if you're a, a, you know, a visual or a listener, um, you will find webinars. You can go to our, our website and you'll be able to sign up to the webinars. And uh, Denise mentioned the next one coming up by um, Cass Urban Mead. Um, that's next coming, it's in January. Sorry. Next week is all about honeybees, actually. Um, but you can go and you can you can sign up and watch our webinars and all of our webinars are also um, stored on our YouTube channel. So you can go to youtube.com slash Xerce Society and you'll find um, dozens of previous webinars plus other um, videos and other resources. And then beyond this, I mean, obviously there's so many other places you can go. I mean, sure, the Xerce Society, we have a lot of stuff, but that doesn't mean that we're the, the only place to go. Um, you know, check out your library for, for books, for other information. Um, talk to your park district. A lot of park districts either have um, classes um, or they just have information available. It, it's surprising how many have, you know, local plant information or, or guidance on, on um, conservation work. And the same if you have a, you know, a city environmental department, they often have lots of good information available. You'll also find local groups such as the Master Gardeners, um, garden clubs, naturalist groups. Um, they will frequently have information available or enthusiastic, keen people who can come and you know, walk around your garden with you and point out the good things or how you could improve. You also look for your community college and continuing ed classes there. Um, I mean, I always, I, I, I always think, gosh, if, if I stopped learning new stuff, um, I, I would, I would feel like my my life was a little less interesting. Um, so, check these out, and and you'll probably find some um, pollinator classes, some um, naturalist classes, you know, all sorts of um, relevant information. And of course, the internet. I know the internet's a big thing, um, but there's a huge amount of really good information out there. Um, from yeah from Xerces but also from other organizations National Wildlife Federation has a um, a plant finder that I'm I'm sure Doug Tallamy talked about because his his work has has informed that um, but there are other local organizations um, you know again state level na native plant societies etc 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 and all of that information is lurking out there to be found. So those were like the broad general resources. And now I'm going to, to dive in and look a little more closely at those four principles, the flowers, the nest sites, the um, avoiding pesticides and sharing the word. So you want to plant flowers and it's really obvious because butterflies, bees and so on, they, they need flowers. That's the food that the adults use. Um, and for bees, that's also the food that the adults are collecting and taking back to the nest to feed their offspring. Big things to think about. Locally native plants are generally better. I know, again, Doug Tallamy's work has um, underscored the importance for native shrubs and, and other caterpillar host plants for supporting butterflies and moths. But there's also some evidence that native bees, because they co-evolved with native plants, you know, native plants will support a greater abundance and a greater diversity of native bees than non-native plants. So locally native plants are great. You can also think about the bloom period because you try to have flowers bloom from when the early bees are emerging after winter all the way through to the end of summer. You can think about the color. Um, bees see um, colors. They see a similar spectrum width to us, but the way their eyes work, green and red are the same color to them. So you can imagine how difficult it is to find a red flower against a green leaf. So bees like yellow, white, um, purple, blue, and they also see ultraviolet, which we don't see, but there are flowers that have ultraviolet colors to them. We also like to encourage a diversity of, of flowers because with so many different bees, you know, I mean, 3,600 plus species of bees in this country, 
Um, depending on your state, you know, there's more diversity in the West. So Oregon has 650, 800 species of, of bees. Um, Ohio, I think, is more like 300, maybe 400 species. Um, and so but with that kind of range of, of potential species, flat, all sorts of flowers, flower shape, flower color, flower, flower growth, et cetera, et cetera, will support the greatest abundance. And these days, as we're all facing um, climate change, um, we always encourage people to think about drought tolerance. And that also brings back to my comment earlier about finding a plant that will live in the conditions you have, rather than trying to create the conditions that you don't have. And although I've said native plants are best, that there are some really good non-native plants. Um, and within non-native, I mean, for me, for example, where I live on the West Coast, purple coneflower is not native, but it's a great garden plant. So that would be a non-native plant in our gardens. So there are some plants that are, are good in a formal landscape, um, and, but it's worth choosing them carefully. And so to help nail down some of the more specific choices you might have, um, so Society, we have created plant lists um, that cover pollinator friendly plants, i.e. primarily for bees, but also butterflies, but also a, a, a series of um, other fact sheets that are about monarch nectar plants. And that's specifically to support the fall migration of, of the monarchs. Um, and so you'll find that we have pollinator plant lists for most regions. Um, we, I think the bit we're missing currently is the, is the Rocky Mountains, um, but we do have monarch nectar plant lists for every region. And obviously some of the monarch plant lists um, are, are great nectar plants for bees too. We also have other information because I mean, sure, which flowers is an obvious first, but I mean, where are you going to plant them? How can you plant them? How are you going to do your site preparation? Um, do you want to plant them as, um, you know, seed? Do you want to plant as um, nursery grown plants in pots? All of these things are considerations. And so we have a number of resources that will help you, you know, look at your garden and do an assessment to find out what, what you have. Um, taking back to the early question of, you know, what do bees need and what do, what, what, what do your garden provide? And then once you've decided that, we have, um, you know, site preparation, meadow creation, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I do want to call out in particular gardening for butterflies as I think that's probably um, the book that has the most comprehensive information about um, you know, designing, planning, installing, and maintaining a pollinated garden. Um, but also I'll mention the Pollinator Conservation Resource Center and some of those um, planning and installation guides there that are primarily written for an agricultural audience also have um, good information that, that can be translated through to a garden. Of course, it's a little sobering, you know, you've gone through all of that and you're like, great, I know what I want, I know where I'm going to plant it, I prepared the ground and you get to the plant nursery and can you trust those plants? I mean, it's shocking um, now and we've, I mean, we, Xerxes, we've done a couple of um, uh, research studies um, in the last two or three years. One was looking at milkweeds growing um, in California, in the Central Valley, both, you know, roadsides, farm field edges, gardens, parks, etc. cetera. Um, and then more recently, we um, purchased milkweed plants from retail nurseries across the country. And all of those, the, the leaves were tested for pesticide residues. And shockingly, there are many, many, many pesticide residues on those plants, so many that make some of those plants unsafe. You know, we have systemic insecticides that get into the plants. And whilst they're great at protecting the plant from, uh, you know, being chewed or having its juices sucked out, you know, chewing insects include caterpillars. Um, other insects collecting nectar or pollen, you know, also are exposed to those pesticides once they're inside the plant. Um, and 
as the studies have shown, you know, there can be dozens of pesticides um, showing up on one plant. Um, and even plants that are sold as being wildlife friendly have contained numerous pesticides frequently at levels that are known to be hazardous to, to monarch butterflies in particular. And so this brings us all back down to what we are calling be safe plants. You're looking for plants that are grown without the use of systemic insecticides. You're looking for plants that are, could be considered, you know, because you buy a plant, you put it in your garden and those chemicals are still in the plant and now they've gone from the nursery to your garden. And so, you know, we, we have this guidance on, on, on questions you can ask at the nursery to find out what the plants have been, have been treated with. And, and from that, you can make an assessment of how safe is that plant. Or you can track down a, a, a local plant supplier and then you can connect directly directly with the grower and understand what what they're doing and how they're treating their plants. Increasingly, luckily now there are more and more native plant nurseries or or at least small plant nurseries who are growing using organic methods or um, you know pesticide free methods or non chemical methods. And so it is becoming easier to get. Um, pesticide free plants, but it still takes some effort. And it's just really, it's just, I say it's really sad that you could go to you know, your, your nearest, most convenient plant nursery and see these plants that look glorious, but not know whether they're safe. Not all conservation should be effort. There are ways in which you can improve your your garden by putting less effort in. Um, we find that a lot of pollinator gardening, it's we're encouraging people to, you know, it, it, it's like less manicured, a little less tidy, you know. But we're trying to bring some of the um, the irregularity, the wildness back into landscapes. And so that one way you could just not bother mowing. Um, and there is no mow may now, which is um, an initiative, um, because manicured, mowed, treated lawns offer little or no habitat value. And it's estimated that there are more than 50 million acres of lawns grown in the US. And that actually makes lawns the country's largest irrigated crop. No mow may, it was first. Um, promoted and launched by the nonprofit Plant Life in Britain. And the idea was that by not mowing your, your lawn in the spring, um, you know, you would be providing flowers that would be able to support the bees that are beginning to emerge from, from their overwintering. Um, and so in, in Britain, it was, it was great because May, uh, you know, your lawns have already started growing in April. By May, you might be thinking you need to get the mower out, but that's also a time, you know, also when the bees are beginning to beginning to emerge and are looking for that forage. So by just not mowing your lawn, you are bringing more flowers back into the landscape to support the bees. Um, and, and we got involved with this because of our um, Bee City USA network and a pair of affiliates in particular um, around Appleton in Wisconsin. Um, launched it there and we're like, well, this, this looks good. And so we started sharing it. And then we also produced um, some resources and mostly blogs and web pages. And that's on our B City USA website. Um, so bcityusa.org. Um, and of course, with all of these URLs, you don't need to remember, a, right? You just go to whatever search engine, whether that's Google or Bing or Yahoo or DuckDuckGo or whatever. Um, and just type it in, just type in Nomo May and you'll pull up all sorts of information. Um, and one of the early ones in your search will probably be um, the B-City sites. Um, but and a lot of this discussion around Nomo May at the moment mostly goes around dandelions um, and, and honeybees, but really Nomo May is about so much more than that. If you do want to get involved with Nomo May, um, it's like I always think it's great to add a sign um, to tell people what you're doing because 
for some people they might just think that you're, you're you know you're untidy and that you're not keeping up standards um but this just shows that actually your your lawn is it's a conscious decision to let this happen um and one it informs people that you're doing it for a reason and two maybe it'll recruit more people to join in because um, that's the underlying reason why our fourth principle in bring back the pollinators is share the word because you know if you're doing one thing if you can you know one more garden in your neighborhood does it then that's awesome but i'm saying no more may is about more than just dandelions and honeybees because really i mean if we're going to transform our landscapes um i mean yes a, an unknown lawn is better for bees and there, there's lots of um studies that have been done that show you know reduced intensity reduced frequency of mowing allows flowers and there's more um, diversity and abundance of bees but it's not great i mean it's still a lawn it's still probably weedy flowers um and uh, just by not mowing by you know leaving your mower in the shed for an, a few more weeks you can't you know can't go yay wait well done we saved the bees woohoo um because we're not and the way that Xerxes have approached no mome is yeah it's great but it's really it's a, co open, a conversation starter um not mowing is not the end point you know dandelions and clover and honeybees are not really the bee conservation um we think upon no mome as a starting point because yes it it's a step forward, it's an incremental improvement, but there's so much more we could be doing. I mean, okay, so you don't let your, your grass um, get cut um, and you have some weeds growing, but maybe you can do something all year. Maybe you could have a meadow on part of your lawn in, instead of a lawn. Maybe you could plant a flower border. Maybe you could plant some flowering shrubs if you've got a, a shadier area, you know, spring flowering shrubs. Maybe the spring ephemerals could be growing on, on, uh, underneath your trees in the spring instead of just trying to have weeds growing on your lawn. So there's lots of benefits, but um, not mowing is, is not the end point. So nesting sites, um, this is really significant for our, our um, native bees because they spend so much of their life dormant in the nests. Um, wherever we can, we like to retain existing or natural sites. So snags, dead trees, bare ground, um, shrubs with hollow stems. You know, Again, it takes us back to not having manicured, tidy landscapes. Um, we can we can by having some of this chaos and untidiness in then we can um, support all sorts of uh, wildlife um, we do have guides that you can find on our website um, for having more stems more untidiness um, you can also add b blocks or bamboo bundles, paper tubes, et cetera, et cetera. And there's lots of information about that available. Um, some from the Xerxes website, but we typically promote more about creating the, the more natural conditions for, for these creatures, um, but you'll find that elsewhere. We're also encouraging people to keep the leaves that fall. Um, this is lots of benefits from leaves, organic matter, you know, you can use them to mulch your flower borders and keep moisture in. It most certainly increases diversity of wildlife. Um, you know, there are lots of specific examples of, of insects that benefit from leaves. You know, lunar moths wrap their cocoons in the leaf on the tree. And when that leaf falls, the lunar moth cocoons are down there amongst your leaf litter. Red banded hair streaks, um, a really lovely little small butterfly, they lay their eggs on oak leaves that have already fallen so that when their caterpillars hatch that old oak leaf is the first thing it feeds you know woolly bear caterpillars we, we see them crawling around um, but they're heading they're looking for some shelter and leaf litter can provide them with shelter um, fireflies if you're lucky enough to have fireflies in your garden you know as larvae they're hunting down you know slugs and uh, you know other soft-bodied insects and so on and those are the kind of things that we're living amongst your leaf litter so your fireflies benefit from leaf litter too um 
very particularly bumblebees over winter in Queens will gain shelter from, from hiding underneath leaf litter. And then obviously, again, insects are just the foundation. So you, you keep this and then, you know, robins, song sparrows, fox sparrows, towhees, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So many birds that will be hunting through, looking for prey in, 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 on the ground. Because you don't need to leave the leaves everywhere. This is not about smothering lawns. Um, you know, this is not about keeping your, your um, driveway or your sidewalk or your steps or your paths. I mean, you know, it's not about, um, it's not like absolute, gosh, you've got to leave all the leaves. It's compromise. You will do what suits you. You could have your leaves in the back of a flower border. You could rake them up and mound it up at the base of a hedgerow or underneath some shrubs. You could um, push them up against the back corner of your your garden up against a fence, wherever, some place where you can where you can keep leaves, and you will be introducing some of that untidy, some of that wildness back in, um, supporting the life. Um, and so, yeah, to keep them where wherever you can. And again, it's like with no more may tell people why you're leaving leaves because in many areas people think it's just untidy. Um, and so you can, you know, you can get signs, you can make your own sign. And again, our website, um, Leave the Leaves, you will find information. But beyond leaves, you can also stems. Um, and I'm sure Heather Holm talked about this because we worked with her to create one of the leaflets and brochures we have. But you, many of our bees naturally will nest in, in hollow or soft scented stems. And so if you're growing flowers, leave the flower stalks intact over the winter and then come the spring or the late winter, prune them down to about anything between about eight inches and 24 inches high. Um, and then you just leave those, those stems. And in time, the, the rest of the vegetation will grow up around them again and you'll not notice them, but you will find bees nesting in them. And that, that lower photograph there is a small carpenter bee um, that is digging away at making her nest. And you can also build stick piles, um, big, small, whatever you've got, you know, logs, twigs. Another way to introduce a bit of untidiness and a, a bit of um, uh, another factor into your landscape. Um, you'll find bees will nest in, in the hollow or broken twig ends. You'll find chipmunks and others will nest in there. You also get song sparrows and such like will move in and nest in these areas too. Lots of benefits, um, you know, chipmunks, for example, are one of the, an abandoned chipmunk nest is one of the preferred nesting sites for our endangered rusty patch bumblebee. Um, and so the, by creating all these different components, you can support the entire life cycle. Pesticides. Um, Gosh, I'm watching the time here and I realize I've been talking, I've been rather slow, so I'm, I'm gonna speed up. Um, pesticides, we want to be avoiding them. This, this photograph shows dead bumblebees um, lying on a, a parking lot after the trees were treated. So um, even, you know, unintended impacts from, from, from pesticides, particularly insecticides. I know there are times when you might be using them, you know, if you have, emerald ash borer, for example, you might be looking to treat to contain um, a, a, a problematic invasive species. Um, you might also use herbicides to, to spot treat for problem um, invasive non, you know, plants and so on. Um, but typically in most gardens, there isn't probably a need to use insecticides, um, but if you must use them, minimize their use, read the guidance carefully, you'll find many insecticides have what's called a B label that gives a guidance on you know, things to do to minimize the risk to bees. But be aware that even if you do all of that and follow all of that guidance, the B labels are, are largely based upon research that have been done with honeybees. And honeybees, one, are not native, two, are a very different biology from our solitary nesting bees and even our bumblebees. And so using, you know, guidelines that will protect honeybees 
won't necessarily protect anything else. That those dead bumblebees, those trees were treated following all the appropriate guidelines, but the trees were still toxic to, to bumblebees for weeks after the treatment. We do have information on, on the website um, about you know, pesticide management, um, alternatives to pesticides, ways to, to manage mosquitoes in your garden, for example. But a lot of this, you just have to get used to the fact that your garden is going to be chewed, eaten. You know, it may not look like that pristine garden you've seen in, in magazines or adverts on the TV or whatever. Um, but I mean, frankly, get used to it and pull up a chair and watch because this is the life that you want to have in your, in, in your garden, in your landscape. This is why you're creating a pollinated garden. The, that, that top photo shows um, leaves of a redbud tree that have been very heavily used by a leaf cutter bee to, to take leaf pieces back for their nests. And the bottom one is, is a monarch caterpillar. Um, I mean, if you, don't, if you don't want holes in leaves and blemished plants, then um, pollinator gardening and wildlife gardening in general is, is not a good idea for you. Um, but also, once you're creating a pollinator garden, you're creating an entire habitat that will support a wealth of other animals. Um, lady beetles that eat aphids, for example, as both adults and, and larvae, lady beetles are major predators. Surfid flies, their larvae eat aphids and other soft-bodied insects, but also the surfid fly adults are pollinators. You can have ground beetles and, and fireflies and all sorts of other animals, um, insects, predators in, in your garden that will be suppressing and controlling the things that you may not want because you're basically creating a new ecosystem. Um, sharing the word can be anything you like. There's no right or wrong way of, of doing it. Um, this example of this, this person was a bit of an artist and so they just started painting rocks um, and leaving those around their garden and other people's gardens too. You can take to social media, you can have your own social media if you're on Facebook or Instagram or, or Twitter or whatever, you know, in addition to sharing news stories or family updates or whatever, you can also start posting photos about your garden. Um, you know, things you've seen, seasonal changes, um, things you've done, plants you've planted, et cetera, et cetera. There's lots of little ways in which you can just make people more aware of pollinators. Um, if you're an organization, you can set up and run accounts for an organization, whether that's a garden club or whatever. You can also signs when, I mean, yes, there's fancy professionally made signs available from, from Xerxes and other organizations. Um, there are businesses to do that, but you don't have to do that. You can make your own. There's, again, there's no right or wrong way of doing it. It's just get that information out, share it with people, um, take a moment to tell people what you're doing and why. You can do things you know, beyond your garden. And sometimes it's a little beyond your comfort zone too. Um, letter writing is still very powerful. Um, you know, maybe you want to see changes. You would like your city council to um, change policy on pesticides, for example, or use of native plants or weed ordinances. So write to your politicians, write to your city agencies. There may be nonprofits um, who, who, you know, maybe it's a conservation nonprofit and you'd like to see them do something differently. Maybe it's a housing, you know, social services nonprofit and you're like, wow, you've got these great gardens, these, you know, pollinated habitat in these gardens around, uh, around these, these low income homes may make these homes nicer, more attractive for people, bring all those emotional benefits. Homeowners associations, yeah, if you don't like the fact that your homeowners association says that your grass can only be that long and your plants can only be that high, you know, there's a great chance to write. You can also, again, reaching community, you can start writing articles, columns, op-eds, neighborhood newsletters, um, local newspapers often love having people write for them. Online communities such as Nextdoor now, there are lots of ways that you could do this, you could just write a piece about importance of pollinators or you know, choosing plants or leaving the leaves or you know, whatever, and then just pop it out there on, on, on your next door or promote or 
send it in to your local newsletter or newspaper. You can also get directly involved with guiding your community. And if you feel like it, um, look, do join city advisory groups or parks advisory groups. If there's a public consultation on a new project, a, a new road, a new housing development, um, you know, a, 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 a new park, go out, find the information and share your opinion. Because if the only thing that will not lead to change is you not doing it. Um, if, if, if you take a time to have your say and to share your opinions and make your suggestions, then things may, may change. Now just coming for the, the wrapping up here, um, some other things you can do. Uh, you know, other ways you can stand up for pollinators. One, community science. Uh, we use community science at Xerces for gathering very valuable information. Um, we have some monarch projects that operate in, in the West, um, counting overwintering sites and also just general observations on, on monarchs and milkweeds across the Western states. We have Bumblebee Watch, which is um, nationwide and I mean United States and also includes Canada um, and it's very simple all you do is you take photographs of, of bumblebees um, you can then upload those to bumblebee watch through the app on your computer or via the website on your on um, uh, sorry app on your phone I should say or via your computer direct to the bumblebee watch website and would we'll take any observation of, of any bumblebee it doesn't have to be rare it's just gradually we're, we're building up more and more information. And then if you have the time, we do have um, bumblebee atlases projects that are either state-based or regional based and California, Pacific Northwest, Great Plains, we're about to launch into the Southeast. So we've covering about half of the United States, or at least the continental United States right now. And these are take more time and, and effort and dedication than, than Bumblebee Watch. You have to adopt an area, you have to complete the training, you have to commit to doing at least two surveys um, during the summer. And you also then have to compile all your data and observations and photos and submit it all. So it does take some time, but the information and the knowledge that we gain from that is huge and has led to, you know, um, conservation guidelines for you know, um, Washington I and Idaho, for example, and we're working on something similar for California. I wanted to pause for a couple of minutes and talk a little bit about Bee City USA um, and also Bee Campus USA so that we have the, the city um, as a, a way in which if you would like to take pollinator conservation to the kind of to the next level, um, do what you're doing in your garden, uh, in your community garden, and get your entire community involved, or your um, college university campus involved, then, then this is for you. It um, was created by Phyllis Stiles back in 2012, and Phil did an amazing job um, of creating the fundamental requirements and the structure, and it's focused on creating um, habitat, reducing pesticides, and doing outreach. Um, and then she came to us and said, would we take it on? Because she wanted to retire um, and wanted Bee City, Bee Campus in, in a safe hands. Um, and we said, yes, because it's frankly, it's an amazing thing that Phil created. And you can find more information about it at bcityusa.org. Um, the requirements are to create habitat and it's not onerous. You must only have to do one habitat project each year, um, but that could be, you know, many acres of prairie or, you know, half an acre of meadow or one street side planting. It's a, it adapts itself to, to the, the resources and the scale and the capacity of the affiliate. But, you know, over 8,000 acres of new habitat have been created in total. You reduce pesticides and sometimes this is 
or dropping pesticides altogether and shifting to non-chemical pest management and pest prevention. Um, other cities or campuses have eliminated the use of neonicotinoids or specific um, groups of pesticides that are known to be especially harmful. Others are um, campaigning because they I mean there's so much you can do on, on city-owned land, but you can't necessarily do it on um, private land. So you know, that photo below there, the example of the, the affiliate in Decatur, Georgia, and they have a this really great campaign to try and stop people from spraying their individual gardens for mosquitoes. And then the outreach, and this is where the, you know, the creativity of the, the affiliates really comes to the fore because it's such a range of activities that people do from, you know, webinars and garden tours, city um parade floats crowdsourced surveys apps you know on and on and on there's all sorts of things but even with and now we have more than 300 affiliates but when phil brought it to us um you know it was about 120 affiliates but over the period of b city and, and the 10 years of growth um, more than a million people have been reached so if you're interested go to the bcity dot bcityusa.org website and you'll find information there you need a committee um, because you need you should be able to sustain it um, the application involves a resolution to be approved by the city council the idea is that if you want to be a b city you really need to have the city involved um, and then you submit your application and pay a fee and we at Xerces uh, primarily Laura Rost who's our uh, B City coordinator she's around to help you answer your questions guide you through the process and when you become an affiliate we send you a welcome pack full of our books and signs and other resources and information um, and then we're always coming up with new information to support you um, as an affiliate and to you know, training resources, more information that will help people build their capacity and therefore have a bigger impact on pollinator conservation. Obviously, you can follow Xerces Society on social media if you want to find out more about what we're doing and get up, keep up to date on uh, new blogs or new resources. Um, in the same way that Denise said, you can donate to support um, the, the, the webinar series. Xerces is a donor supported nonprofit um, and you know you can donate to support us as well and with that I've reached the end and I did actually take the full hour and I didn't think I would so um, thank you for all your patience and I see that the Q&A has been busy there um, and I'll hand it over to Marsha who will decide which questions to ask. Great. Thank you, Matthew, so much. Um, and you've already got uh, some thank yous in the chat box. Folks, if you need to hop out, um, I know that Matthew would appreciate uh, a thank you for the presentation. So many great resources shared. And I will ask a few questions. But first, I wanted to let you know that um, for our participants, I've been uh, busily typing and adding links as Matthew has been sharing. So <laughs> some of your questions have to do with some of those resources. And I've added them to our website. So I've added links to to Bee City and Bee Campus USA for the nesting and overwintering habitat uh, handout that Matthew shared. The Leave the Leaves is up there, reducing pesticide use and impacts I've added, and information on how to uh, get your hands on a sign or those Xerces books. So all of those are on our uh, website. Oh, and one of my favorites, Matthew, the organic site preparation for wildflower establishment. So if you happen to be on an organic farm or you're working with an organization that uses organic methods, there is a really great Xerces publication that talks about those organic site preparation methods. Maybe you don't want to use Roundup or another, um, you know, um, synthetic herbicide. There are great recommendations in that uh, publication. So those are all up there for you. Uh, and then uh, we've got some great questions. So can you address, uh, several people asked about what you feel about raising monarchs for mass release. What's the, um, the latest perspective on that, Matthew? Um, we don't encourage that at the Xerces Society. Um, there are several potential downsides of that. Um, you can, you know, there's always the risk of disease spread. Um, there's one parasite in particular called OE, 
um, its full name is much longer and more of a tongue twister, so I'm, I will just call it OE. Um, but that is a, a, a little parasite that um, can lead to monarchs not completing their um, their life cycle. Basically, you know, they they may not emerge, or they emerge and they're, and they're deformed, and it's passed from um, one monarch to another via milkweed. Um, or via contact. So there are some of these very distinct disease issues so that um, breeding needs to be really, really carefully done if you're going to avoid those. Um, there's also some um, suggestions that the monarchs are weaker um, and they're not completing their, the migration once, once they're released. Um, so, but also, I mean, I know that the the experience of watching a butterfly transform. I mean, it seems magical um, and it, it is an amazing thing to see, you know, the caterpillars growing and the chrysalis and then the butterfly emerge. Um, and so, the, the, I mean, a, a small number that you might, that you might rear in your, in your backyard or, you know, the porch or wherever um, is, is just great. So like, you know, less than 10 maybe is probably a good number. Um, but our primary focus, and let's be honest, the real reason why monarchs have, have nosedived, you know, we can look at the numbers and even if last year was better and mm, early signs are from um, California, this may be another good year, which is so exciting and so reassuring. Um, but let's be honest, the major problems that monarchs are facing are a lack of habitat um, and insecticides. And um, those are the major issues we should be addressing. Um, rearing monarchs and releasing them doesn't change the conditions on the ground and across the landscape. And the monarch is a, a, an intriguing insect because of its migration. It connects us all, you know, whether we're in Ontario or Oklahoma, you know, we get connected because it could be that butterfly from, a, from Ontario is going to pass through that garden in Oklahoma. Um, and so we should be working everywhere we can to, to be making sure there's clean, safe, um, quality habitat to support the monarchs. And that's what will lead to recovery and not simply breeding and releasing. Great, thank you. There were a qu couple questions about shade and I know this question comes up a lot and I, I know that you, uh, because we have participants from all over can't address specific plants yeah. for shade, but how can folks find some, um, you know, which plants can they include in a shady space for, for pollinators? Yeah, and, it, and it's awkward. Um, and it also may slightly depend on the type of shade. I mean, I've got a kind of shady garden because I, where I live in, in my patch of suburbs, I'm very lucky that there's actually an acre of forest right behind the garden. Um, but it's mostly Douglas fir, so it's conifer, so it's shady all year. <laughs> um, and if you're in a broadleaf forest, as, as there are some broadleaf forests here in the Northwest and um, certainly across much of the, the East, you're, you know, you have dense shade in the summer, but not in the spring. And so you're naturally your sunshine and your growing period is that spring. And so there are spring flowers that, that you could be, be growing um, that will bloom before the shade appears. So things like spring beauty or trout lily um, are some possibilities. There's also um, trees and so it's for some of these shadier areas, shrubs and small trees come in um, because these are naturally the plants that will bloom earliest in, in, in the spring um, and provide a burst of flower. Um, and then if you start looking really at, at shady landscapes, the places where flowers grow are in the sunshine. And so if you have a super shady area, you can increase the sunshine. Um, in, a, in a forest, naturally, you'd have like wind throw and beavers and dead trees and all these other things that create little little sun patches. Um, and so you'll, unfortunately, if you have a really shady um, yard, you're probably going to be limited to, to growing around the edges. Okay, thank you. Let's see. Um, 
So there were a couple of questions about um, where folks can find some funding. I don't think Xerces, you don't do like a mini grant program, do you? It's, um, some suggestions for where people can look to pull some funds oh, in. Um, we, we don't have funding. What we do have, and we have in some regions, we have what we call our Habitat Kits program. Um, and so we um, contract grow native plants and then um, are able to provide people with a habitat kit. Um, and depending on the region, it, um, you know, we have one that's um, working in Santa Fe where it's, it's specifically designed for gardens. And so gardeners can get a kit that consists of about three dozen flowers and one shrub. Um, and then in California, the kits are much bigger and you might get 1500 flowers to create a prairie. And we have those in those regions plus um, the Northeast, so from New Jersey up. Um, and we're also working to expand those to new regions. Um, and so we are, we, you know, we take requests and we can't give kits to everybody, but we look to find um, individuals, farmers, organizations, park districts, whatever, who, who will be able to make good use of these and look after these plants. Um, other places you might look for, for funding, there are some national organizations such as the National Gardening Association who have small grants. Um, there are also often, you know, you will be able to tap into state level grant giving. Sometimes that's from state agencies or county agencies who have small grants. Again, a lot of these, because, you know, depending where you are, there are different issues. You know, in California, people are trying to get rid of lawns and save water. So there are local grants from like your water district that will help you transform a lawn to a native landscape. You may also find um, foundations or nonprofits focused on education who will have small grants to support school gardens. Um, and so some of this is, is just a, a question of looking online. And so there are, um, there are various possibilities, but there aren't really that many like, like, like national organizations that you can, I can just recommend. Um, but this also is a libraries. I, I'm always amazed at the information that you can dig up from your from your local library. And the librarians, I also find often really like it when you go in with an intriguing question because you say, "Hey, I need this information." I'm like, okay, that's really you know, rather than like, "Do you have a, another copy of the latest Harry Potter?" You know. <laughs> When I love all those many suggestions, sometimes it's just, Marsha and I were talking about this before we started, um, sometimes it's just that little spark, you know, your plant kit or just, you know, $50 towards a project to get it, something going. And it's amazing what can happen with that, that little bit of input. So I would, again, uh, like you, encourage folks to look at their, you know, county extension offices, soil and water, uh, fish and wildlife. A lot of times those oh. groups will have small, um, small amounts of funding that might help. Yeah, to of course, because I, I, in my head, I'm thinking gardens. Um, mm -hmm, but, mm -hmm. you know, if you, if you are a grower or a rancher, then for sure, you know, NRCS, um, um, your soil water conservation district, your rural conservation district, et cetera, et cetera. There are some, some great cost share um, programs out there, as well as tons of advice that, that you can tap into. Okay. Uh, let's end with Kelly's question. She had lots of upvotes on hers, and I'll read it. The, the park I work at has planted a large amount of native wildflowers in front of the visitor center. They mowed all of it down about two weeks ago, using the argument they need to prevent woody growth. Is there an argument to make that would encourage them to leave the dead stems and seed heads, presumably next year? Um, yes, the, I mean, there, there, there is. Um, uh, and hopefully I was able to, because I think that question turned up fairly early in the Q&A. So I, I, early on I was scrolling and I saw it. But hopefully the information I gave about Save the Stems will have answered some of that because, I mean, particularly if it's um, you know, like a demonstration garden or a wildlife habitat, to have cut it then, you're doing away with a big chunk of its potential value for wildlife habitat. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you know, you can leave the stems, the seeds will feed the green finches and whatever else, you know, gold fin green. I was going to say, green finch is a British bird, a European bird. Goldfinch, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, 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 the lesser goldfinch 
it's kind of green and I'm always getting those two mixed up, but um, sorry, it's my, it's like you can take the Britain out of Britain, but you can't take it out of the Brit or something. Anyway, um, so yeah, so birds, et cetera, will, will live and feed on those seed heads. And then you can cut them down, you know, later in the year um, to create more nesting opportunities. If you have woody problems, then some, one, of, one of the ways to deal with that is to go in, um, and I don't know how big this, this habitat is, um, but if it's park district, volunteers can be a fantastic resource to tap into. Um, I, I know of a park centre that has an amazing um, native plant garden outside of it, not far from where I live, and it's entirely run by the volunteers. Um, and so volunteers can come in and you can dig up you can pull up the the woody ones you don't want the same as you might have um, non-native thistles in there you can also spot treat with um with herbicides to contain those specific plants um, if it's a bigger habitat you can um, instead of mowing the entire area break it into three or four zones and mow one part each year so that then you know you can contain and suppress the woody growth that you don't want, but also allow the habitat that you do want to to develop. Great, and thanks, uh, Matthew, because that answered Jeffrey's question too about how to um, maybe do portions of the meadow uh, to prevent sure. that woody habitat. So <laughs> again, Matthew, thank you so much for all the resources that you shared for sharing your expertise today, uh, folks. Lots of of good comments and thank yous in the chat box. I really appreciate that. And uh, we'll see you next week for our final session with uh, with Shana Bird from the Jaws Arboretum. And um, thanks again.